Okay, so sometime around the early 4th millennium BC, thereabouts, uh, humanity makes a major leap, a major advancement that historians have subsequently called the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age. It doesn't happen all at once. Uh, of course, it, it's not an, an overnight experience where, oh, we're in the Bronze Age. Uh, and again, there are mysteries about the ancient world that have been completely lost and we just don't know. Um, nonetheless, something really significant happens around this time period. It's called the Bronze Age because of the prevalent use of bronze, go figure. And bronze is when you smelt copper and then alloy that with tin. But there are two centers of Bronze Age culture that we will focus on in this uh, part of the lecture, and that is Mesopotamia and Egypt. Now, Mesopotamia, this region, this fertile crescent, located, uh, situated primarily between the Tigris and Euphrates. And you'll notice immediately on looking at this map that we have cities. And so one of the major characteristics of the Bronze Age was the rise of cities, the first cities. But there are many other things going on. Uh, intensive agriculture really takes off. And in fact, actually, the uh, Sumerians, Sumer, the ancient, the first empire in Mesopotamia, they had the earliest writing. They also had, they also mastered irrigation agriculture. Irrigation agriculture, the, the artificial application of water to the soil uh, in order to boost crops. Invention of the potter's wheel the first uh, law codes, the first uh, centralized states and empires. When I was in high school, uh, I was addicted to Age of Empires. Some of y'all may uh, be familiar with Age of Empires. I spent hours and hours on end playing Age of Empires. And uh, it, it was a fantastic computer game. I liked it a lot. Probably spent too long, uh, wasted too much time on it. But it actually, to be honest with you, uh, increase my love for history, but every time I, th I, I think of this time period, I, I hark, um, harken back to the, uh, uh, to the old Age of Empires computer game. Uh, but really, I mean, major, major advancements. Um, the first social stratification, advancements and, and some negative things. Uh, the dawn of slavery or organized slavery. I mean, slavery has been around for as long as human beings have been around, but became much more formalized during this time period. Organized warfare, major advances in astronomy and mathematics. The most, pop, uh, most heavily populated city in ancient Sumer was Ur. And Ur, by, the, by around uh, the early third millennium, had a population of 65,000, 65,000. Pretty impressive. Division of labor becomes very, very complex in this society, in this economy, an extensive labor force, high degree of specialization in different trades and arts and crafts. The trade, uh, trade network spanned just again, hundreds and hundreds of miles the very far away lands. And so, as you can imagine, there is a money, there is a currency. A ziggurat of that uh, in ancient Sumer. One of the earliest currencies was grain currency. And as you can imagine, grain just forms a, a central, uh, essential role in ancient Sumerian, ancient Mesopotamian society. And so grain operates as a medium of exchange. Um, we'll look at that a, in a little more detail here in a moment, but it's also noteworthy to, to mention that there, in ancient Sumer, there were also these very uh, uh, mysterious clay tokens that have appeared in archeological digs. And there's all sorts of speculation about what these clay tokens were exactly. Many archeologists have speculated that or reasoned that these clay tokens were a symbolic money or a representative money that they may have represented 
certain primary trade goods, trade goods like livestock, grain, human labor. And these clay tokens have appeared in digs in, uh, uh, in central locations uh, dating back to the early fourth millennium. Then they faded out. We don't, so we don't know exactly what it was. It may have tracked debt payments or payments to uh, the government. We don't know exactly, but they played some sort of monetary role. Very interesting. May have been the first fiat money. Again, uh, the details are a bit scant, but they existed for a, a, a short period in ancient Mesopotamia. But grain currency was the most common among uh, among the common people. Again, we'll look at that in a moment. But um, also silver currency, silver currency, silver before gold, actually, silver before gold. And there's no coinage yet, but the uh, Sumerians did acquire a lot of silver through uh, long distance trade. And in fact, uh, most of their silver came from what today is Turkey, sometimes called Asia Minor. If you look at a map here of old map, there's Asia Minor. And so trading probably grain to this region for silver. And the silver took the form of all, all sorts of different forms, but it was it was prolific. And and by about the year 2500 BC, silver became the standard currency in the region. Now there was no unit of account, right? Remember, a unit of account is like the dollar, the euro, the mark. No unit of account, but the Sumerians adopted a unit of measurement. A unit of measurement and here we have one of the most famous units of measurement in the ancient world and that unit of measurement was called the shekel the shekel now the shekel didn't just measure the weight of silver it also uh, measured the weight of barley bronze all sorts of different goods and a shekel was equal to about four tenths of an ounce or two fifths of an ounce and then from there you had other um, units. The mina was worth 60 shekels or about two pounds weight. And the talent was worth 60 minas, rough, equal roughly to about 120 pounds. It's interesting actually in the, um, in the Bible, the first um, record, uh, uh, one of the earliest record, uh, uh, records that the Bible has of the use of money comes in Genesis chapter 23. Abraham, who is living in Ur, leaves Ur and buys a field for the cost of 400 shekels of silver. 400 shekels of silver, which amounts to about 14 pounds of silver. That's a whole lot of silver. It indicated that Abraham was a wealthy man. So silver was the first uh, grains, these clay tokens, then silver really takes off. Uh, gold as the Bronze Age proceeds becomes more and more uh, plentiful in Mesopotamia. And here you have some ancient Mesopotamian gold artifacts. And the gold primarily came from, uh, well, there were several areas. In the ancient, ancient world, Bulgaria was a major, what, what today is Bulgaria, was a major source of gold. They had gold mines there. Bulgaria is located between Greece and Turkey. There were also gold mines in Nubia, and Nubia uh, today is northern Sudan, so just south of Egypt. And then Punt. Punt is on the uh, uh, northern part of the Horn of Africa, just north of Ethiopia. And so those were the major gold mines of, the, of this ancient, ancient period. And these became more prolific as, uh, as the Bronze Age continued. Now, the ancient uh, Su uh, Sumerian Empire um, collapses uh, due to all many factors we don't need to go over here, primarily outside invasions, over irrigation droughts. It's replaced by another Mesopotamian Empire, the Babylonian Empire. Now, there are two Babylonian empires in history. This is the first one, the old Babylonian Empire also ruling over Mesopotamia. 
and uh, the Babylonians continue the tradition of using silver and gold bullion, not coinage, not invented yet, and grain currency. There's a silver seal used uh, from this period, the old Babylonian Empire. Um, the Babylonians, you, if you are knowledgeable of your world history, you'll remember as under this empire that the uh, Code of Hammurabi was, uh, was established, that famous law code. And all throughout that law code, there are references to money. Mon uh, establishes rules for money payments, fines and fees, establishes rules for interest on debt, private property, money contracts, all of that is, is uh, uh, found throughout Hammurabi's code. The Babylonians also uh, invent a sort of, uh, 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 or fall upon a, a certain um, proto-banking system, you might call it. Um, money lending was very common in the ancient Mesopotamian world. You, if you were a merchant or a, um, a, a tradesman with uh, lots of liquid assets, you would lend them out to individuals at interest. If uh, you were a merchant and you had gold and silver, you had the option of depositing them in temples for safekeeping and you paid a, a deposit fee, a storage fee, Generally, it was about 1 60th, whatever you deposited, you paid to the temple for safekeeping. The temples also lent out gold, silver, and grain at interest. Merchants also lent out grain to, to, various, to farmers and tradesmen. Um, and what this looked like, you would lend out seed grain. And then at harvest time, you received, uh, you received the um, payment from the whoever had borrowed that seed grain with interest. So I mentioned we, were, we would um, look a bit at the grain currency, just briefly explain what this was exactly. Um, it's not that people went around with, you know, grain in their pockets or lugging it around. Um, there was always a gap between planting and harvest. And so when harvest came, that's when you settled all of your tabs, you might call it. If you had any debts, you settled it at harvest time and delivered up that grain. And uh, so it was not a currency like silver and gold in the sense that, you're, you're necess that you are necessarily exchanging it at the moment, but something that you settle later. Nonetheless, I still think we can um, call it a currency because it was still ultimately used as the medium of exchange. And for most people, they had no contact or very little contact with uh, silver and gold and grain would have been the only medium by which they could have acquired things. So that is ancient Mesopotamia. Let's take a look at ancient Egypt. Ancient, uh, Upper and Lower Egypt united into a single kingdom in 3150 under a single pharaoh in 3150. And the Egyptians, of course, were uh, just astoundingly, uh, astoundingly advanced and in, in intelligent people. And you look at the, uh, the span of time in which this empire was around, I mean, two millennia, a fairly stable kingdom. Now, the height of ancient Egypt was from roughly the uh, uh, middle of the second millennium, so about 1500 BC to about um, 1069 BC, after which Egypt fell into decline and um, in different uh, foreign invasions and such. The advancements, I mean, are, are, were incredible. Um, just massive construction projects, massive bureaucracy of, of scribes and priests and administrators all under the control of the Pharaoh. Um, you look at the pyramids. I mean, the, the level of mathematics required for the pyramids is, is so so astounding that it's caused some people to speculate, oh, you know, it must have been aliens. No, I mean, there are mysteries of the ancient world, like I said, but, um, you know, human beings, are, the, our capability, our, our mind's capability of, of uh, doing spectacular things is, is quite immense. And, and so these were people that uh, really did impressive things. They also had a lot of evils within their society. Uh, 
much of the, the those construction projects were were uh, done by forced labor and slavery. Um, but very very prosperous empire also used irrigation, benefited from the flooding of the Nile in order to uh, produce a, a crop surplus that then supported the dense population. And so grain actually was Egypt's most important export. And it was with grain that the Egyptians acquired gold and silver. Now gold was in, again, I noted in Nubia and in Punt. So Northern Sudan and the Horn of Africa. And so the Egyptians acquired, acquired much of their gold from there. And, but traded grain to places all uh, over the outside, uh, all um, over the uh, outside region for all sorts of different commodities. Um, let's take a look at some of the Egyptian gold. There's the famous mask of King Tut, a signet right here, a, a bracelet, some other gold items. silver items. There's uh, Horus depicted as a falcon god. You'll notice here this is actually electrum. Electrum is a naturally occurring al alloy of gold and silver. Now the Egyptians also had a unit of measurement but that unit they didn't use the shekel. They, it was called the, the Deben. D-E-B-E-N. It was equal roughly to uh, three ounces of silver. But they didn't have a unit of account, so no unit of account in Egypt either. So um, that has not come about yet, and of course there was no coinage. Um, so silver and gold circulated by weight as currency. And then of course you had grain currency and workers. Again, uh, this was settled around harvest time. And in the meantime, before harvest, things with um, debts and um, what you owed and what people owed you would be recorded and then settled at harvest. But a, a, a simple worker in ancient Egypt was, was paid um, on average about five and a half sacks of grain a month. So that's how they received their payments. So again, um, you're not walking around with it, you know, lugging it around making payments. Nonetheless, it is the currency and that's how you were paid if you were a, uh, an ordinary laborer in ancient Egypt. That is if you weren't a slave. Uh, if you were, if you worked for some sort of wage or payment. Now the Egyptians also had a proto banking system, and uh, we call these granaries. Uh, you could deposit, uh, you would deposit your grain at the granary. The deposit was recorded. If you owed a debt, it could be transferred. If you wanted to borrow grain for whatever purpose. You could do it there. All of it recorded within uh, within the regional granary. These were controlled by the state. This was not private enterprise going on. This was a state operation. Proto banking. Then, if you were wealthy and you had access to gold and silver, you could deposit, like in Babylonia, you could deposit them in the temple, and the temple would would keep it for your safekeeping. All right, so we will end things there and tune in for part C for the early Iron Age.